Let's see if I can share my screen here. Yeah, I can get permission and I'll do that and share. Well, <clears throat> hi everyone. I'm glad you can join me. And I'm going to move away some Zoom stuff from the screen I'm sharing. I hope you see the this slide right now with me speaking and some other information. Is that correct? Making sure I see the right screen here. Okay, good. Uh, all right. Well, welcome. As uh, Luke mentioned, I'm a Microsoft MVP uh, as of February this year. Uh, I work at Excella, a company based out of Washington, D.C., and I love being part of the community in every way I can. I have a Twitch stream. I stream on every Saturday uh, together with uh, other fellow uh, community members. Uh, I, I'm really passionate about what we're going to talk about today, which is ML.NET and machine learning at .NET. It's definitely one of those pet peeves for me that just gets me going. So if you have any of those questions, uh, you know, talk to me outside of this talk, and I'm happy to follow up with you on those. Uh, as such, uh, me and a couple of other community members, uh, we founded a, a virtual conference in May, uh, just around this topic specifically. Uh, John Wood being one of them, and Bree Ackman being the PM, PM on the Microsoft team. Uh, we have actually people in this audience today that have spoken there. So Praveen, uh, he was one of the speakers in May as well. So if you see him in the community on Twitter or anywhere else, definitely follow him as well. He has some great content out there. Uh, I also love, uh, you know, contributing to open source, especially around the ecosystem around machine learning.net. Um, and I've, um, as of late here, been working on some tools for uh, the ML ops portion of machine learning models. So how to kind of make that simpler as well as some .NET new templates. So if you have any questions on that, definitely feel free to kind of see me off this talk and we can chat about them later. So what are we going to do today though? What is our talk going to be about? Well, uh, we are going to go and deep dive into machine learning first and look at some basic concepts and understand kind of what it is from a developer's perspective. Because I think the majority of people in this call are in some way or another, though that developers uh, would have at least worked with that ecosystem. We're going to uh, unwrap a bit of deep learning as well and talk about what it is and what it isn't and why we shouldn't really be so scared of uh, developing deep learning models as well. Uh, and then we'll transition to the third point here, which I will stress is the most important aspect of machine learning, which is understanding the, the model life cycle from start to finish. Because it is a very repetitive action and process, and once you figure out the, the bits and pieces in this, you will have a much easier time building various models for your organizations and companies. Uh, we'll then go and look at ML.net in specific uh, and see what it's all about and what you can do. And then hopefully I'll spend about 20 minutes of this talk actually looking at the code here with you guys. So we're going to build a machine learning model from scratch in .NET and C Sharp. Um, hopefully that's going to be uh, working fine. So, uh, and then we'll, Turn it over to Luke and uh, we'll uh, look at your questions that you may have and uh, I'll try to answer them as best I can. Awesome. So let's start off with machine learning. You know, what is it? When do you want to use it? You all, you all kind of know what it is. You've seen it on your Google Homes and your Alexas, uh, you know, face recognition um, applications all across the world. This is nothing new to you, but let's look at kind of what, how we define it and how we can work with it. And how does it relate to something like AI and deep learning? What is the difference here? Well, machine learning is actually a pillar of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is generally like anything that enables a computer to, to reason and act as a human being. And under AI, there's a lot of different things that are not ML. Like we can think about if-then statements in just uh, normal C-sharp as being AI in some way, if it mimics a human behavior. And we can also think about other statistical things and decision trees kind of falling under this category. But of course, one of the strongest pillars is machine learning, which has grown a lot the last few years here. And deep learning, as you can hear a lot about lately, is a subset of machine learning. And it's taking machine learning to the extreme. Uh, it's more or less machine learning of steroids. And this is where we look at more advanced stuff, such as uh, image classification and speech translation and such things that require uh, the use of neural networks and deep learning. So if you just look at it more objectively, I think machine learning to me is something that is programming the unprogrammable. It's a case where we can't apply normal software engineering principles to a problem. For example, recognizing the image because 
an image can have varying depths and perspectives and zoom levels and coloration and so forth. So if we would have like an if then uh, statement on maybe determining uh, pixel values to form a pattern that we can recognize a person or a cat, it would very quickly become very difficult because we can't generalize that uh, logic very well. So that is where machine learning really uh, comes into play. And to give an example of that, just look at this video and uh, kind of see and kind of be a bit amazed as well of us, how far we have come in the last 10 years. Let's see if it loads. Hopefully you should also hear sound here. Is this a deception? Do you intend to destroy yourselves? Just to show you how primitive humans are, Tolosian. We had not believed this possible. The customs and history of your race show a unique hatred of captivity. So as you see there, right, we have Jeff Bezos and we have Elon Musk being portrayed on these uh, uh, characters in Star Trek, which, you know, it's by using just conventional software engineering would be near impossible task to do. Because as these people were speaking in this original movie, we can just kind of uh, um, put their faces and their expressions on top of those existing filmed uh, movies. And this is something called, you know, uh, deep generative networks or deep fakes, uh, which is another word for it. And uh, it's being heavily used in the industry today, uh, both for good and for bad. But this is something that we just can't program. So we have to use machine learning to do it. But if you look at a concrete example of machine learning in general, we have um, a model that we're trying to create in the end, right? And a model is something that we has, has an artifact that can be used to predict unseen data. So new data coming in. And we create the model by just kind of forcing down a lot of data into an algorithm or choosing in a process called training. And what that means is that we have, we have a process or an algorithm that iterates over a set of data uh, to figure out how to best fit the model around that data so that it's most accurate when it does predictions. And we can then evaluate that on unseen data to understand if this is actually a model that works um, outside of the sphere as well. If you look at more precisely what a model is, uh, it's nothing more than just math, right? It's a function of number of inputs and it will give you an output. And the most important thing with this slide is to get familiar with some of these terms. I am not a developer, you know, I've always been. And when I started with machine learning and data science, I was kind of taken aback by all the terminology that data science has. And I would say in general, a lot of these terms are very simple things, but uh, they make it much more difficult uh, to understand because of these terms can be a little bit uh, complicated. Um, these terms are not so complicated, but they are mentioned a lot which are features and labels. And when you hear labels, that is what you're trying to predict in a machine learning model. So for example, that could be a house price. If you're doing house prices in your area, it could be whether something is a fraudulent transaction or not, or uh, if it's a tomato in a picture. And the features is what you need to supply the machine learning model with to make that prediction. So for a house price prediction example, right? That could be number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and the square footage things that has predictive power uh, to actually make an accurate model here. And of course, in this function here, there's a lot more uh, uh, detail. There's things like weights and biases and so forth. And the algorithm depends a lot on your use case. But in general, this is how you can see a model being. And we're trying to fit that function to our label based on our incoming features. There are multiple types of machine learning out there. Um, and uh, the three most common ones are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And the reason why it's important to kind of at least know the distinction between them is because when you're trying to create a machine learning model for a, pro a problem, it's important to start at this top level here because the algorithms that you need and the data quality and the data structure you need is going to depend on which type you are looking for. So supervised learning, is when we have labels. So that's any regression problem or classification problem of any sort. And what I mean labels, what I mean then is that we have data where we know the uh, you know, existing condition and the actual outcome. So for example, again, to go back to a simple example, house prices. We know the house prices for the last you know, 100 years or I don't know how long. And we also know uh, the parameters that made up for those house prices. 
So we know that if we had a two bedroom apartment in 1995, this is the price that we're gonna get. And the same thing with like, uh, you know, classifying tomatoes in an image, we can easily get pictures with tomatoes. But we can say, hey, this is a tomato in this picture, it's a cucumber in this picture, and it's a potato in something else. So we can label our data so that we can, in a supervised fashion, teach our model that this is how uh, things are. Uh, please extract any patterns that you have from this so you can ex uh, extrapolate this on unseen data. So if you get a new picture of a tomato that you haven't seen before from a different angle, you can figure out this tomato. Unsupervised learning is without labels. So we have no idea of what things really are in the beginning. And this is very useful, for example, for clustering or principal component analysis or anomaly detection. For example, if you want to segment your customers in a, in a multidimensional space, let's say that, uh, just take an example here, like Luke is a recruiter, right? So uh, Luke knows that certain candidates probably are more suitable for certain firms because of their cultural values. Maybe they have some experience uh, with certain technologies and so forth. Uh, this makes them a more likely candidate to be successful there. Um, one thing you can do here is you can cluster all of his client base here into different segments. So uh, just use this algorithm to uh, just distinguish what, they are, what the differences are. And maybe he'll get a cluster of government uh, uh, clients, yeah, maybe we'll get one for you know marketing and so forth, but he won't necessarily know the names of these clusters. He will just know these are similar. So if a client, if a candidate works for this client, if a similar uh, candidate comes around, he can also know that hey, it should probably work for this cluster of clients too. And finally, we have reinforcement learning, which is a, a hot topic, uh, and it's all about you know game development in some ways, but it's also used much more heavily uh, right now. Um, Azure has a service for this actually, uh, for Q&A. And it's about uh, using rewards and penalties for a machine learning model to learn. And usually this is very useful when you have um, a successful action very far down the line. So for example, a client may, you may have a recommendation engine for products and uh, you don't have an immediate feedback whether that client actually wanted a uh, product and liked the product and so forth. But you can tie that loop back over a long period of time with something called rewards and penalties and reinforcement learning. But from this slide, I will take away supervised learning because I think that's the, the most commonly used one in industry today. All right, so that's machine learning. Now you're all fluent in machine learning. You can put that uh, machine learning uh, engineer title in LinkedIn and you're good to go. You get a much higher salary. Luke can place you uh, at a better, better job. Uh, jokes aside, uh, we're going to go into deep learning and look at what that is, and especially neural networks. So I mentioned that deep learning, right? It's a subset of machine learning, and it's when we start looking at speech translation and image classification and those things. And we usually want to implement something called neural networks when we do so. So what is a neural network? Well, you can represent it as something like this, right? It's um, it's a linear network uh, with multiple layers where you have an input layer, an output layer, and something in between that you don't know what it does. And that's kind of a deep, deep neural network. If you have two or more layers in between, that's called a deep neural network just by definition. But to give an example of this that's more concrete, let's say we have a fraud classifying example here. We're trying to predict a fraudulent or non-fraudulent case uh, based on input data, which could be type of transaction, the amount that this transaction had, and your location in the world. So for example, right, I'm in the US, if I uh, currently had a transaction on my card in the UK, that would probably not be very good because I'm not there. So it's a high likelihood of a uh, fraudulent transaction based on that. So a deep neural network is very useful because you can feed the network tons of stuff and it will figure out itself what's important and what's not important. Uh, and eventually at the other end, make that determination. And it uses something called weights and biases to learn on the way. And uh, let's look at more about how that process works. And by doing that, let's zoom in on one of these neurons itself. So one of these green dots and look at what it does in detail. So each uh, dot in this network, right, is called a neuron. And a neuron is nothing else than an abstraction of linear algebra. And I don't want to lose you on this because it's very easy to get kind of sidetracked here about, oh, linear algebra, calculus, uh, a lot of, you know, X1, Xn and math. And it's easy to get kind of, oh, it's complicated. 
I was definitely like that in the beginning. But it's actually a lot simpler that, than a lot of people think. What each neuron is doing is only taking each input value. So remember the type, the price, or something like that of my transactions. And it's multiplying that with a random number called a weight. And then it's adding all those things together. And then it's passing that to the next neuron in the network. So it's only multiplication and addition. Incoming things and then pushing it out to a new neuron. The key here is those W weights. The weights is the way the network learns. Because uh, it will, for example, a fraud case, location in the world is very important, depending on where you are relative to that transaction. So that probably has a very high weight, a uh, very high possibility of um, being useful for your prediction. And uh, the network can quickly learn these things by iterating over data and getting to a place where uh, it will have a better and more accurate model in the end. And if you sum that up, there's six terms here that are useful for neural networks that are the building blocks of them. The first one we discussed, right, is an abstraction of linear algebra, which is a neuron. You may hear the word epoch, and an epoch is just uh, passing through all the data through the network one time during training. So we're trying to fit the network based on the data one time. That's called an epoch. And you normally want to train the, the network on multiple epochs, so multiple times. Um, weights and biases, right? That is the things that is uh, multiplied and added to input data. And it goes uh, between each of these neurons. And these are, this is the way the network stores the knowledge and learns. Backpropagation is the process of adjusting these weights and biases based on the feedback it gets from the network. So uh, the feedback here being the loss function, uh, which is calculating how far away a prediction was. So for example, if you have a picture of a tomato and uh, during training process we say, I think this is a cucumber, it was pretty far away from that guess right. So we can use a loss function to calculate automatically, okay, you were, a, you were very far away from the guess here, that was correct. I'm going to, through back propagation, adjust your weights a lot because you need to get back on track. So that uh, process of backpropagation and adjusting weights and biases based on the calculation how far away from the right answer you were is the way the network learns. All right, we have uh, still not the same number of people on the call as when I started talking about deep learning, which is good. So I haven't lost anyone yet. So thank you for sticking with me, guys. So switching over now to the model lifecycle here, which is gonna be much more applicable for most kind of use case scenarios today. And then we'll go into MODELnet in specific for the lab here. So when you train a model, there are a couple of steps you will follow. Uh, gathering your data, splitting your data, transforming your data, training your model, evaluating and deploying it to production. So let's look at each of these steps in detail to understand uh, what you need to think about and what it's all about. The first step here being gathering your data. And I can't emphasize enough how important this is. Uh, you need to collect a lot of data and a lot of columns for your data, so features. The more data you have uh, and the broader the data is and the more diverse the data is, the more likely you have of success. Not every problem is predictable and not every problem is possible to create a machine learning model for. And uh, I encourage you all to use both uh, data you have internally in your company, but also data you have outside on the web. There are a lot of public places out on the web you can find data, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, you have the European Union having a lot of public data, the UK as well. Uh, counties and cities have public data. Uh, of course, all the cloud vendors have data as well. So just kind of look at where the data is and see if you can aggregate, the, aggregate that to solve your problem. Once you have your data, what you want to do is split it into two parts. You want one part to be a training set and one part to be a test set. The training set is used to create your model, right? It's going to be for the training process of iterating over that data to fit the model, which is great. And usually that's like 80 to 90%. The rest of the data is kind of stored away, hidden in a locked box that no one can see, so that your model, when it's ready, you can try to predict uh, based on that data and you can evaluate how good it was. So if you give it 10 rows of uh, uh, fraudulent cases, right? Uh, sorry, two cases are fraudulent and maybe eight are not fraudulent, you can then measure how many got right. And that will give you the accuracy of the model. But it gets, it's very important here to not show that data to the model during a training process because it will 
memorize that data and we'll learn from it, which is not what you want. The next step here is to transform your data. And this is like a butterfly, right? We usually have a lot of raw data. Raw data is dirty and it's in the wrong shape. Uh, it's the wrong kind of structure and everything. So what you want to do here is you want to uh, clean the data, remove any missing values, any outliers, and especially you want to transform the data to numeric values. Uh, a machine learning model can't work on text directly. You need to, in some way, change that to numeric value. And in, in most cases, that's pretty simple. There's a lot of built-in functions for it, um, but it just depends on your specific use case here on how you want to do that. Once you have your data in a good uh, place, there's going to be a one line thing, one code line to train your model. And in this step, you want to pick your algorithm and get going with the training process. Uh, I just encourage everyone here not to be so afraid of this step. Uh, I was definitely very worried about picking an algorithm in the beginning, but most of these algorithms are categorized underneath a specific ML task. And as a data scientist, uh, I'm a data scientist by, by trade, but I, I know a lot of people at my company that are, and uh, they don't pick the right algorithm from the start. They try multiple, like five or 10 of them, and then they measure which accuracy they have and understand based on the data, which one is the best. I think the only thing that comes with being like more of a data scientist that work a lot with this is that you'll find the right algorithm quicker based on experience but you still want to try a lot of them. So just go ahead and try one, see how it goes, and try a new one. It's free. So once you train your model, go ahead and evaluate it. Uh, depending on your use case, there's different ways of doing this, but accuracy is of course the most common one. I would just want to stress that there are more metrics in accuracy, and depending on what you want to do, uh, you should rely on those more heavily than accuracy. For example, something called precision and recall, which measures your false positives and false negatives and true positives and so forth. So just make sure you think about that and just kind of use Microsoft Docs or Google bits on which metrics is uh, important for your specific scenario uh, or your ML task per se. Once you've done that, uh, you're at the last step. You got a shiny model, you're happy with it, it's awesome. You wanna show it to the world. And uh, you can deploy your model in many, many ways. You can either put it into like an Azure function, you can deploy it in a Docker container if you want to scale quickly, uh, but you can also embed it into your application. And this is where ML.NET really shines because it gives you a lot of different deployment scenarios out of the box. Even locally, if you have a desktop app or whatever. So you can do it offline or online or some kind of hybrid. Uh, your imagination is really the limit here because uh, it's just C-sharp. All right. So that was a model lifecycle. And now I want to switch to the last part before an example here, which is ML.net here. And taking everything we learned, all the theory here, and applying it to this specific library for machine learning in .net. So what is ML.net? And why am I wearing a shirt? I love ML.net. Well, because it's awesome. I've always been so curious about machine learning for many, many years. Uh, but I didn't really want to leave the guardrails of the nets and go into Python and R or Julia, uh, where I really couldn't use my expertise as a software developer um, to build these models. So when ML.net came about about two years ago at MS Build, uh, I was just directly taking it back and started investing my time in this. And it's awesome because it's built on the .NET core. So it's super performant uh, and it's a lot faster to train your model on uh, and uh, uh, predict your outcome than something like scikit-learn or uh, anything that's based on Python. It's open source, of course, uh, so you can have your own issues and pull requests. You can run it on Linux or IS or whatever you want, more or less, which is a fantastic feature, uh, which makes it compete with uh, the big uh, libraries like scikit-learn and, and uh, PyTorch. Uh, it's .NET, so you can deploy it wherever you want to. It's in your uh, home court here. It's just going to be a normal like method in C sharp that you are fully uh, custom to, and you're going to you know give it data, and it's going to give you back a prediction. But it's offline, so it's not necessarily cloud-based. So you can kind of do what you want here with this solution. A lot of support for automatic ML as well. So if you want to um, start by automatically creating a machine learning model, you can do that uh, using some tooling in uh, Visual Studio as well as on CLI tools to do that as well. So definitely check that out as a good first example. We then have um, you know, notebook support. Uh, if you've worked with data science in general, uh, you may know that uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks is uh, one thing that you can use for 
prototyping and exploring your data sets. Uh, as of November last year, there is now support as well for this in um, ML.NET. So you can have a .NET kernel in Jupyter Notebooks and you can use Plotly or other open source libraries to plot this uh, as you please. Uh, and of course, finally, there's uh, deep learning support uh, to some extent, not as intensive as uh, you will see in other libraries, but, uh, but still really good. And what I like as well about that is that they're not trying to you know, build a new TensorFlow because everyone uses TensorFlow. They are instead incorporating TensorFlow under the surface. So just like you know, Python has uh, uh, Python bindings on TensorFlow, uh, so does .NET and C Sharp in this case, because TensorFlow is written in C++, not in Python. So that's really awesome to see as well. And I think we'll see more growth in that area going forward. So when you train a model, uh, as we'll see in just a bit here, what you do is you load the data in something called an iData view in the beginning, uh, which is just an in-memory in representation of your data. You then create a data pipeline by pending transformations. Uh, for example, replacing null values and so forth until you finally call fit to fit the model uh, and evaluate that to your metrics. And when you're happy, you know, you save it to a zip file. So the model itself is going to, come, is going to become a zip file that contains everything it needs for predictions. You can then load your zip file into your um, consuming application and uh, create a prediction engine that you can use for predictions uh, at a later stage. So if you wanna get started off this talk in any way possible, um, I would highly suggest you go into the community samples repo on GitHub here for MLNet samples. And they have all kinds of samples for various use cases. And it's a great way to just understand um, you know, how things are constructed and uh, how they look and uh, what case you can use in your own organization. If you want to get started with templates, so .NET new, new templates that we'll see today, uh, I pushed a package on NuGet just this weekend that gives you a starting point for, uh, for that, that loads all the NuGet packages we need and sets up a, a structure that you can use to train your model. Uh, there's also templates there for deployment scenarios if you want to embed it in a Docker container. And uh, in addition, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of tools getting created now in this space. For example, mlops.net that helps simplify the tracking of this process. For example, tracking metrics, uh, tracking uh, uh, hyperparameters in your data, uh, simplifying the deployment process to a Docker container or to a URI and so forth. So for example, if you're curious about that or want to learn more, definitely check out mlops.net. Uh, and if you want to help contribute, uh, I would gladly welcome that uh, on the team. So just let me know. All right, enough talking. And I think you're pretty much on time, which is awesome. So now I want to build our model together. And uh, if there are any questions uh, at this point, let me know if uh, there's something I can clarify. Otherwise, uh, I'm happy to take those at the end of this talk as well. So what I want to do right now is let us build a machine learning model together here. And uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to build a Titanic example here. And let's see, which screen am I sharing, by the way? I hope I'm sharing the right screen. I think so. I think you see an Excel sheet. And if you're not, then let me know. So a good example of uh, that, I'll check the chat just to make sure that's the case. Where did the chat go? Chat. Perfect, Excel, thank you guys. So a hello world example for machine learning is really building a Titanic model to predict the likelihood of surviving the Titanic. So for example, the data sets that I'm talking about right now are available on Kaggle, which is a place that you can find data for your use cases. And one of those examples that we'll talk about today is Titanic. If I can spell this. But there are also more, of course, relevant pieces than this. But based on the Titanic data set here, we know who were on the boat. So we have the names here of each person. We know which passenger class they were in. We know the gender, the age, and siblings, and all kinds of stuff like that. And we have indication here, zero or one, if they survived or not, based on that data. 
So what we can do here is that we can build a machine learning model to predict whether uh, me or someone else here based on our age uh, and so forth uh, actually would survive this Titanic ship. And uh, yep, you will definitely be able to get the slides later. More than happy to provide that. So uh, based on that, let's see how we can get started, right? So the first thing, of course, is getting the data. We have the data. And now we want to start building the model. And what I could do here is I can open up Visual Studio and I could, you know, do everything here, uh, import the NuGet packages and get started that way. But since I want us to be very efficient here, and I also want to show off some of those, these new templates, uh, we can build it using those new templates instead. And as I mentioned, I pushed a NuGet package up here to NuGet uh, for these kind of .NET, new, .NET new templates. If you want to use them, you can just copy this and install it in your command line, something like this, right? .NET U, install, templates, and hit enter. Doing this would install these templates locally on your computer. And if you went, wait for that, we'll see now that we have a couple of new templates here. Two that are related to training and one for deployment. And they're called MLNet training here. So what we can do now is we can do .NET new MLNet training and that will create a console application for us to start using. So we'll go ahead and do that. It will create the project and the resources. And this is where it was created. And we can go ahead and click on this to open it in Visual Studio. And I can do this in Visual Studio Code as well, but I wanna make sure we have no hiccups today. So I'm gonna do it in Visual Studio uh, instead. And I'm going to move it over to the right screen because you open on the wrong screen. Great, let's pin this here. So what does this template give you? Well, it gives you a console app here and a program file with the most basic stuff uh, kind of laid out here. First of all, it will give you a dependency to Microsoft ML. That is the NuGet packages uh, that we need to use here. And uh, the way things are done in, in ML.net is that we are again loading our data, splitting our data, transforming the data, training the model, evaluating the performance, and then saving it to a disk, right? Those are the things we talked about during the life cycle. And everything here resides around an ML context, which is an ML.NET construct. So you'll find every method and every action you need on this context itself. So you just have a look at that. And that's kind of why I created one here in the beginning. And if you go into that and look at the code, since it's open source, right? We will see different uh, properties or catalogs on this context and each of them has its purpose. So for example, loading data, you'll find under the data catalog, saving your model will be under the model catalog, transforming it will be here and so forth. So pretty good. What this template then does is that it will load the data from a, a text file here. So what I want to do is to load it from this Excel file. So to do that, what I'll do is I will copy the data over to this folder so we have it locally. And uh, I think I have it on my C drive here in a Titanic folder. So I'll go ahead and copy this over to my net to the core folder that we have today here. And that will allow it to show up here on the right. To make sure that we can now uh, include that when we train our model, I will right click on it and I'll ensure that it's copied always to the output folder here. And uh, that will just copy to the bin folder. So when we run this uh, XC here, it will, uh, just be part of that. And the path to the data will then be data.csv because we can use a relative path. So we're saying, hey, this is my data path. This is where my data is. I have headers. So I have these uh, you know, headers in this Excel that I can skip. And it's a comma separated uh, file. By default, it will look for a tab separated file. And as you see here as well, we need to define a schema. So the, the scheme of the data. And right now the schema is empty. So we need to define what that is. And this is just gonna be normal C sharp with properties. So we'll say that, you know, we have a survived property, which is our label, right? That is what we're trying to predict. And if you look at the data as well here, so we have survived, we can use a couple of these, for example, for our model. So let's use P class and let's use the, uh, let's use the sex as well, or the gender here as an example. So we'll see we have you know uh, p class here as one property, 
and we'll do a string sex here for the other property. So these are our features, and this is our label that we are trying to base our model on. And to make sure that this library can read the data, we need to understand the, the index they have. So this is going to be zero, the first column, right? This is one, and this is three. And to help the library, we can annotate our properties with a load column attribute. So zero for survive. And let's see here, load column. One for the, the second one. And then finally, we're going to do three for the gender column. And this is using the Microsoft ML data namespace, if you're curious. All right, so we're all set for loading the data. So this is going to work just fine now. The second thing here is to train the data. I'm uh, sorry, to split the data. Uh, you remember we had to, this train and test data set, and we're going to use the train set to train the model on and the test set to evaluate the model on. And there's built-in functions in Ambleton.net to do that. So we take the context we already created here, and on the data uh, catalog, we have this method called train test split. And we just pass in the data and we'll do the the split for us. We'll set to like a 90% training and 10% test set. And then we come to those sections here that we need to fill in. So we need to fill in our, uh, in this case, our uh, transforming pipeline. So how can we massage the data in a way that makes sense? And the things you need to massage here is going to be the gender column and potentially also the passenger class. But first of all, we need to do this because we, this needs to be a numeric value. It can't be a string value. And the way we can do that is by going into the ML context, the actual instance here, right? And uh, we can go to the, let's see, do I spell it correctly? I don't think so. Transform catalog here into the categorical namespace and do something called one host encoding on a specific uh, value here. Let's see if I can get to this one and I'll explain what that is. So what we wanna do here is say, okay, I have this, this binary column. We have a male and we have a female in this case. Uh, please transform this to numeric values. And one hot encoding is a way of doing that. And what we'll do behind the scenes is that we'll create two columns. One that is called something like is male and another one is called is female and there'll be binary values in each. So for example, if it's a male, uh, it will have two columns, right? And it's going to be a one in its male, and it's gonna be a zero in its female. That's called one hot encoding. We can also use something called featureized text that will kind of do this to n-grams and short-grams behind the scenes, but that's mostly used when you have multiple different um, permutations. The cardinality of the column is very high. So for example, if you have a description or a long text, uh, that would be a useful uh, way of doing that. Awesome. So in this case, we don't have much else to transform because the passenger class is already afloat, it's already a numeric value, and it has no missing values in this case. So the last thing we want to do here is just append the, the, the feature vector. So we need to decide which ones are going to be used for our specific model here. And we can do that by going into the transforms catalog again concatenate here, create a column called features, which is what I'm doing by saying features here, and then defining which ones should I include when I train my model. And we have two columns only here, so we'll do include both here. So we'll include P class, and we'll go ahead and include, uh, let's see, the sex column here, All right? All right, so this is a very simple pipeline. It will be more complex in general, but just to give you an example, this is how it would look like here. And you will, you will keep appending these transformations using this append keyword here, uh, and kind of create a method chain that we're pretty useful use with in C Sharp. So once we have that in place, what we want to do then is create our training here and train the model. And you see here on line uh, 36 in this case, this is where the magic happens. This is where we do the fit uh, call we pass in the train sets and actually get a model that we can use to predict uh, unseen data on. Uh, but we're going to pen the trainer to the data processing pipeline first, and we need to select a trainer here. And depending on your ML task, you will find them in different places. 
but it will always come from ML context, right? In our case here, we're going to do binary classification. Binary because it's two, uh, sorry, yes, but two, you either you survived or you didn't survive. You did never ended up in a limbo state here in between. So we have two choices. So we're classifying, classifying between those two choices. You can then find the algorithms under the trainer's uh, namespace here. And if you expand that, we have multiple choices. And you can get even more by including additional packages here. And they have very complicated names, don't get me wrong here. This is pretty difficult to understand what they're doing. Like field aware factorization machine. Oh, I don't know what that's all about. But again, just try different ones. They have a different implementation underneath, but they are pretty simple to use. And I just encourage you to try them, evaluate and see what we get. So we will do the logistic regression one, which is the most simple one. And we need to pass in the label name here, which is going to be survive. So we just need to define which column, uh, what's the name of the column we're trying to predict. And it will do everything else for us. All right. And the final step here is to evaluate the model to understand how good it is. And to do that, we need to do two things here. We need to create the um, predictions. So we need to take the model we created here on line 37, and we need to throw all the test set on it so we get predictions on each of those values. And based on those predictions, we're going to calculate metrics like accuracy. And we can do that pretty quickly by doing uh, predictions. And then on ML context here, go into our ML task and then hit evaluate. And into this evaluate method, we'll pass the data. And this is going to be the test train, sorry, train test split, I think. Test set. And uh, uh, I think that's all we need to do actually. And based on the predictions, we can calculate the metrics using the library here. So we can do ML context here. And uh, again, we'll go to, actually, sorry, we'll do ML context. Uh, this is the metrics. And uh, what we need to do here is call the predictions instead. Sorry, going too fast here. Predictions is going to be what we need to calculate here. And we can use the model we already created called transforms. And here we'll pass in the test set. Test set. That will create the predictions, which is what we're going to pass into the evaluate method here, which will spit out the metrics, which is great. And finally, what's doing here is saving this to a zip file using the model save method right here. So we'll get a zip file based on the name we created. And in our case, it's going to be called model zip. So let's see if I made any typos here and let's try to run this and see if it actually works. So let's hit F5 here and run this console application. All right, and we can just step through this and see what's happening here. So we're loading the data and we have this loaded data view now. And this is just in memory. So it's a lazy loaded uh, data set. It won't actually load until we hit fit. And uh, here is splitting the data. We're creating an estimated chain here, creating a trainer. This is where we actually do stuff. So let's see if this works. Okay, good. It trained the model. We create predictions. We calculate the metrics and uh, I think I need to pass in something more here. Yep, sorry. That'll be quick. We need to give the name of the, the column here as well. So which one's a label? That's survived, right? And fix that. And we'll go straight here now again, because I do want to show the metrics for you guys. Let's like, make it go through here. Okay, we're back here again. All right, perfect. So metrics here, you can now expand that and you can see that we have an accuracy of 83% and we have other metrics here as well that depends on your use case if they are valuable for you or not. But all of that uh, in a couple of minutes and now you have a machine learning model that you can use in your Azure functions or in your ASP applications and whatever you want to. And the process for training these models are very similar whether it is something else, it's the same steps. It's just a different pipeline here and a different algorithm right here. All right, and with that, we are on time. And I would like to leave the rest up to you, Luke, uh, for any questions uh, you may have on the call today. And uh, thank you very much for joining in today and, and listening. I really much appreciate that. 
I'll Ooh. give you back control. Thanks, uh, thanks, Alex. That was uh, yeah, very engaging. So I think we reached about 54, 55 people and the vast majority have stayed on to the end. So um, yeah, very, very good talk. There are, um, there are a few questions in the box. I'll go chronologically. Um, the first one from Callistus. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, he asks, so then the attribution of data on the ends is the expe expectation that you only that you get only what you have labelled, or do you always look for an aggregation of all the data on the outputs? Uh, don't you think I fully understand the question, but I'll try to answer the best I can. Um, you you need to definitely. I mean, label data is important. Then that's a, a process that's very long, and uh, there are ways to automate that, of course. But in general, it's complicated. But in supervised learning, uh, there's there's no way to expect anything that the model has not been trained on. So, for example, you, if you look at the recommendation engine for products, if you haven't uh, uh, you know trained the model on that specific product, for example, if you're given a new product, you won't know to recommend it. You will only know what you taught it, if that makes sense. Hopefully. Cool. And then from Stuart. Do Bayesian networks also use back propagation and loss functions? I'm not too familiar with uh, Bayesian networks, but any neural network uh, in deep learning uses back propagation and weights and biases. That's kind of the underlying foundation on a deep neural network. Uh, so if, I don't think a Bayesian, uh, was it? Bayesian? Oh, sorry, Bayesian. Bayesian. Yep. I think that's more of a, an algorithm itself, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, on how to uh, how to kind of adjust uh, the weights and biases based on uh, your data. And then from Mark, he asks, "What's the learning curve of MLNet versus the Python ML ecosystem?" If you're not already a C sharp guy, great question. Um, I personally, I mean, I am a C sharp guy, so it's a difficult question for me to answer. But I think that the guardrails are in general there for MLNet versus Python. The community is bigger for scikit-learn and Python, so you have a lot more questions to answer on Stack like Overflow and in general. Uh, but being in a typed system like .NET and C Sharp, and being in environments like Visual Studio and you know VS Code, it's very helpful because it will it will try to save you from mistakes like out of memory exceptions because you didn't properly fix your data and so forth. So it's a very forgiving library compared to scikit-learn for sure. Uh, in terms of learning curve, it really depends on the background you're coming from. If you're familiar with Python, scikit-learn is going to be a lot easier. If you're a .NET person, I think ML.NET is going to be easier. Okay. Then another one from Callistus. Um, he thinks potentially it's already been answered, but he said he's guessing they're going to be project templates for starting points. Sorry, one more time. Uh, yeah, he thinks it potentially was answered uh, during your talk, but he says, I guess uh, they're going to be project templates for starting points. Yes, so actually uh, there are some .NET new templates, right? So you can run right now. Um, I actually talked to Brie Ackman, who's the PM for the team. So I don't work for Microsoft, uh, I just love this. But I talked to her a lot and uh, she wants project templates and she wants those in general to be created. Uh, she's still working on having them implemented, but it's definitely on the roadmap and something they want to do for sure. Then Praveen asks, what should be the strategy for improving model slash accuracy? Is it the hyperparameter tuning or data augmentation? Great question, Praveen. It again depends on your use case. Both of them are valid. Uh, I would generally first start with the algorithms. So the hyperparameters or algorithms and number of epochs and uh, those kind of things. Uh, we should just input parameters to function. You're all aware of that. I would start with that because it's quick to do and just iterate over that a little bit. Uh, I would probably change my evaluation metrics a bit and uh, do my uh, folding uh, evaluation metrics. If those things fail, uh, you have to always go back to the data. Uh, either get more data, get broader data, or feature engineer some more data points. But that's always a much more uh, long-running process, and it will take much more effort and be much harder. So if you can adjust your hype parameters, that's a good start first, I think. Um, I had to scroll down a lot because there's a, a lot of questions of people just thanking you and saying what a great session it was. 
Thank you, guys. Yeah, um, Stephen said he assumed only someone with a PhD would be able to tackle this subject. So it's uh, obviously made it relatively straightforward. Um, from Maya, uh, she asks, can we supply other types of data sources or does it always have to be a file on disk? Perfect question. Yeah, no, it doesn't need to be a file. Uh, it could be a, a database view. So you have a, a, a database loader as well. So if you want a, a view or a table, you can do that. Um, you can also load it from memory. So it could be enumerable. So you can have something else, you know, fetching your data and you can pass it in as an enumerable. I think you can also do parquet files. So there's definitely a couple of options you can use. Even I think streaming, if you have too much data to hold in memory, you can stream the data into your model training. Cool. Then um, Stuart clarified Bayesian neural nets uses Bayes theorem. And he's put a little, a little link in there to where you can find more information. Um, I love data science, but as you, as you noticed, I'm not a, a deep expert neither. So, and I want more people to be a part of this community to kind of keep pushing it forward and, and we can learn together here. I think just one last question, unless anyone else has anything. This was from Mark. He said, what was the results of the machine learning on the data sets? Uh, right, Mark. Um, the, I'm trying to see your question there. It doesn't change the data set itself, if that's the question. Um, it will create a model based on the data and it will be able to predict oncoming data uh, based on, I guess, the training process itself. Feel free to elaborate and clarify that question or follow up with me afterwards uh, on Twitter or LinkedIn if you, if you want to. Cool, I uh, think that's it. Yeah, if uh, you're not connected to Alexander on LinkedIn, uh, he's very active, I believe on Twitter and then GitHub as well. Um, well I believe you do regular, uh, regular streams. Um, what, what, you, yeah. what, what days do you tend to do them? They're, they're weekly, aren't they? Uh, they're on Saturdays. I'm going to post some links here as well to different things here. So if you want to kind of follow up afterwards or curious, here's some links as well. But I do every Saturday morning is when I stream. And right now I'm working on the open source tool together with some other people from the community mostly. Um, but uh, happily take input there as well. Cool. Um, yeah, of course, I'll send out some of these links after the event. Of course, this will be recorded. Um, so you'll be able to watch all this back um, in the coming days when uh, I put that all out. But um, yeah, thanks everyone for sticking around. Alex, you've been uh, been very good, uh, which I knew you would be because I've listened to you speak a few times before. So um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming and obviously I'll, I'll let you get on with the rest of your day whilst ours is ending. So uh, I'll, uh, it's been good, uh, good listening to you. Thank you all. And if you want to uh, listen to this more and listen to the PMs of Microsoft uh, at in one minute, we are starting the Donet Community Stand Up uh, on the Donet Foundation YouTube channel. Cool. Hi, right, everyone. Yeah, I'll see you all later. Thank Cheers. you, guys. Bye.